excited to introduce you. <laughs> this is James Wallace, and um, James, of course, is the director of the Department of Equity, uh, Diversity, Equity, and Multicultural Affairs for Indiana University. And uh, we're also very happy to, I'm very pleased to say that he's also a member of our board of directors at Indiana Parenting Institute, and a very dedicated and uh, reliable <laughs> and so um, I would just like to say that it's a pleasure having you here. We are honored um, that Jay took on this assignment, which is to support us in bringing this program to the community. And this is today, for me, is a very interesting um, subject. He had begun this subject uh, a couple months ago, and I had to go to a meeting, and everybody was telling me about how great it was. And, oh, we've got to have another part because it wasn't long enough. So with that understanding, I don't want to take a lot of time. I want James to just kind of get into this presentation so that when you leave today, you leave with all the information that he has to share. And he has some other things to talk to you about with regard to what's going on in the environment here today. Okay, so please just you know welcome James and, and ask questions. I have one more thing to do before I go, which is to give a gift. We give gifts to people. Um, and gift that we want to give today is to the person who registered first with uh, James Wallace's office, and that person is Naomi. <laughs> topic is going to be on the four-year degree attainment experiences of African-American males post-incarceration. So I'm looking at this from multiple levels, from multiple perspectives. You know, what are the barriers to prevent them from being successful? So that's what kind of led me, you know, all the reading that I did led me to this particular topic. So that's a little bit about me and why I feel that I have had the experience and, and, and the information that I think would be valuable for you that I wanted to share with you. Um, so, I want to get a feel for who's in the room. I know that we have some social workers. I know that we have some people that work in law enforcement and others. So if we could just go around the room real quick and you know, say who you are and you know what you do and why you're interested in the topic, we can start with this table over here. Crystal, please. My name is Crystal, and I'm a family support specialist and mental health therapist. Um, I always Chair, the Faculty Committee College. 
and obviously the local campus for curriculum program chair for student success. And about a year ago, we initiated uh, something called the Minority Student Initiative in Mount Rizzo campus. We started with seven students, we're now about uh, 40 students. Yeah? And they encompass as minority students, international students. It's very close to my heart because when I came to this country, I didn't plan on staying, I didn't speak any language. Huh? And so somebody helped me along the way. I met some beautiful people and ended up playing in a college. A diverse group of individuals who played soccer for four years uh, from all over the world. And I developed relationships with my friends from Africa, from Europe, from all over the place. And so I feel like this is my responsibility and my call to help others stay in college and run. Thank you, Danny. My name is Regina Puck and I'm a social worker at Aspire Charter Academy. Uh, I also do provide home-based services to families in Lake and Porter County and LaPorte County. Um, so I'm always interested in keeping my training up and I work with a diverse group of people and I wanted to just come and see what's happening, you know, um, presently with culture and diversity. Good morning. I don't I'm Ida. <laughs> Ida Gillis, uh, retiree from federal law enforcement and retiree from Indiana University Northwest. Presently uh, doing some independent contracts and social work with uh, our Center for Urban and Regional Excellence here. We've been uh, doing some training with our police departments uh, in the county regarding uh, cultural and other uh, areas of concern. Thank you for joining us, Ida. It's always good to see you. Thank you for the invite. We're going to go back to table over there. Uh, yes, my name is Tamara Hall. Um, I'm actually a student here. I'm thinking of criminal justice. I'm also a detective with the Gary Police Department. Uh, I specialize in sex crimes and domestic batteries. Um, this year, like, just trying to get like as much training as possible and just to learn uh, a lot in reference to uh, the subject, culture, and everything. I do deal with uh, a lot of different and diverse, you know, people and stuff. So. But she's also enrolled in the Black Panther. Yes, and I, as my people, <laughs> 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 I'm 
<laughs> so I guess Dr. Hicks knew what you meant. <laughs> Okay, I'm uh, Patricia Hicks. I have been in higher education ever since 1976 when I earned my master's degree back in Ohio. And I am semi-retired. I, I cut my teeth on uh, TRIO services when I was at the University of Toledo, which is a program that uh, was one of the legacies of uh, President uh, Jackson uh, making compensatory uh, education available to those uh, populations that were challenged. And uh, so I continued that, and this workshop falls right down that avenue. Hi, I'm Sierra Jackson with the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Women of Social Affairs here. I'm the assistant for the office, and I'm here to support our department. Hello, my name is Courtney Gillard, I'm the coordinator for the Office of Diversity. Um, here for two things. One, um, I'm part of the design department, secondly, it's a very exciting person. Hello, my name is Jessica Carpenter. <clears throat> I am a licensed marriage and family therapist associate. I'm also a licensed mental health counselor associate. I work for Crown Counseling and out of Crown Point. Um, I do office and home-based therapy, primarily with DCS juvenile probation. I specialize in marriage and family therapy, domestic violence, substance use, trauma. Um, and I'm just here, I do a lot of, I go to court a lot, and I do a lot of advocacy work, and a lot of it, I think, goes back to cultural, so on anything culturally related, I want to be confident in that. So. Hi, everybody. My name is Lauren Smith. I'm an enrolled officer with the Black Center for Justice and Community Development. I'm here to
demand those negative legal ideologies which we counter. I think that this work is all about developing allies, developing friends, people who are willing to work with you, people who are thinking commonly and are working towards the common good. And I think that we all have the best intentions at heart. We just may not know how to have these kinds of conversations. So hopefully at the end of this discussion today, we'll have tools to be more effective in that arena. So before we dig into these conversations, though, we've got to set some ground rules. We've got to set some ground rules. And Glenn Singleton has a book, Courageous Conversations About the Field Guides, which is actually a school that I think is applicable to setting up these kinds of conversations. The first thing that you want to do is you want to stay engaged. So you may hear something that you may not necessarily agree with, and you may turn it, turn off, and no longer engage in the conversation. You have to be willing to deal with those uncomfortable situations. You have to be willing to stay involved with the conversation. Don't tune out. You have to be willing to experience discomfort. These conversations are not easy. They're very difficult conversations because you're talking about some uncomfortable things. But you have to be willing to live in that space. Figure out why you feel uncomfortable about something and then be able to move on. You have to be able to speak your own individual truth. Too often, it's the things that's unsaid and the conjecture that one may make when you don't have enough information that creates the types of stereotypes that are harmful to people. And finally, you have to expect and accept non-closure. I don't have all the answers. Believe me, Dr. Mercado on this patient chair would agree. I don't have all the answers, but you have to be willing to continue this conversation. You have to be willing to stay engaged in this conversation. And I would add one more. You have to respect the historical narrative. Too many times people try to have conversations about race and ignore the historical piece. But that's central to it. It's central to understanding how we got to where we are today. So those are the five agreements for these three conversations that we're going to dig into today. So again, an outline um, for, for this conversation. Some of you were, well, a couple of you, I think, were here before. So I want to recap some of the things that we covered before. And then we'll dig into this racial ideology framework as presented by Eduardo Maria Silva. Um, he's a social scientist who did some significant work. He did some significant research from which a lot of my conclusions will come from. Explain that to thinking, and then we'll share those tools as a way to extend that conversation. So, ready? Okay. Okay. Deficit thinking. A person centered estimation of who failure among individuals link a particular group or characteristic. It's then within this is this idea of hereditariness. And this is something that we talked about last time. That's a doctrine that suggests that genetics is primarily responsible for individual differences in behavior among human beings and or between groups of people. And there's a long history of this nation saying, well, we're, I'm better than you. There's something wrong with you. The way blacks were characterized in the times of slavery and Jim Crow are examples of that where we were suggested that we were beasts and burdens. And we were three-fifths of, of a person. But it was mandated in the law. These ideas are deeply embedded, and they're, they're naturalistic in nature. So it blames, and ultimately it blames those individuals for the inability to function within a system designed to inhibit their success. So you know, there's multiple parts to that. Um, this idea of deficit thinking, um, you know, there'll be oppression. There's the pseudoscience. There's individuals who actually do and conduct research, but their research is often flawed. And one of the people that we talked about last time was Ruby Payne, who positions herself as this person who is an expert on mindsets. Is anyone in here familiar with Ruby Payne's work? Mm -hmm. Okay, she talks about these mindsets or this culture of poverty where you're blaming the culture for the outcome and not necessarily looking at the system in which these individuals are living, the environment in which these people are, are living. And 
Ultimately, it's failing to consider those structural barriers or any other explanation for why these people may not be able to be successful. So at its essence, that perspective of thinking is you're saying naturally or genetically or inherently you can't succeed and you can't be successful and it's not considering the environment in which these individuals are living. That's what deficit thinking is. So, you know, where does that where does that take us? Where does that take us? You know, how does it support the systems of oppression? Uh, here's the diagram that I can hand for those of you who were here last time. Uh, you know, you have an individual, you say you may have a white individual, this person is living in an environment, and that environment shapes their values, their experiences, and their culture. All of these things produces perspective. And that perspective is how they see the world. Okay, you have another individual over here that may be living in a different environment. They have their own values, experiences. They have their own perspective. And the problem is that there's no common ground between these individuals. They're not related to mm -hmm. each other. There's a separation between them. That manifests itself in schools when you have uh, teachers who may have grown up in rural areas and they are not teaching in urban areas. They haven't related to students color, they don't know how these students act and behave, and then they may misinterpret their behaviors and then discipline them, because there's no middle ground, there's no common ground between them, there's no connection. So what needs to happen is we need to have that common ground. That needs to exist. And when you have that, folks are working together, they understand each other, and then their perspectives merge, and then they start to work together. They start to collectivize, if you will, and then they start to move towards a common goal. That's what we need to have happen. But we, what we're having is the converse of that. So that ends up with, because there's no middle ground, it opens the door for, for, for misunderstanding, and it creates a system of oppression. And systemic oppression is simply explained as established processes Systemic is established processes, values, traditions, styles that are embedded in the political, economic, and cultural structures of society. And then you have oppression, cruel and unjust use of authority and power to keep a group of people in their place. And as we move toward the end of our last session, I ended up with this video that I want to show that sort of shows people how all of these elements come together and prevent individuals from being able to be successful. And I'm going to show that now. Bear with me here. And as you watch this video, I'd encourage you to think about some of the images that you see on the screen and what they mean to you, or if you disagree, if you agree.
run against some of those pitfalls and they're going to be devastating. So parents have to do that. But on the other hand, you have to let them know. Now, the way I was socialized was a lot different than the way a lot of African Americans were racially socialized. Because my family was educated and poor. They were highly educated, but because they were black, they were poor. They were denied the opportunity. So I was racially socialized to believe that, and I had to overcome this because this is not right, okay? And I don't, I don't know. I was taught that black people were superior and that, that because black people were superior because of all of these things they had to overcome and still achieve, okay? So that was the way that I was racially socialized. And so, the, but there's a delicate balance that you have to do, that black parents have to do. And we talk about this in our classes. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else in the comments? Yes. Yeah, I was listening uh, to Dr. Hicks. Uh, she's absolutely right. Um, in the old days, I had a lot of really old people in my family. I was telling somebody that I had all my grandparents born in 1880, and one was born in 1859. I didn't know him, though. <laughs> but, he, um, but anyway, and they told their stories, and what she said. So everybody was so down and devastated over this election. I remember I got on the radio a couple weeks ago. Oh, well, one week ago, and I said, just go to the second verse and let every voice to sing, and that's what you teach your children, okay? In other words, we have come. I mean, this is not a new road. It might be some new issues, you know, but we've always overcome the challenges. Um, that, those types of families were back in the day were called race families. Mm -hmm. And uh, race and I came from a race and culture. And um, they never really talked about anybody else even though they knew there were problems within the group, they always thought that if you go out in the world and you start talking about all these problems, then you're putting that problem back on you. You know what I'm saying? So it's a whole lot to that. It's a whole culture in and of itself. Um, people who, as you know, are very highly educated, but we're not a part of the system. So we're not taught that there's anything necessarily wrong with you. You know, I mean, there were things wrong with you that you dealt with, but that it wasn't just you who was told. So were you interacting with these other cultures, or how do you know yeah. this? Well, a lot of the interactions, um, for example, uh, my grandfather, my mother's father, um, taught teaches, and what he did was um, he was into this thing called electricity. <laughs> he had, I have to laugh when I tell that. Because I mean, they can't afford it. A lot of people can't afford it. A lot of folks are in the same boat. 
but that leads to the lower life expectancy. So that's what that's what that is. But the mom is a close mom. It's like she can get around like get around that law, you know. Well, it was enormous to her. <laughs> 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 Which we thought I was gonna ask a question, how do you get in? Um, when I studied anthropology, they talked about um, some things that in human nature. And so one of those is human wants the human man wants to be dominant. So there was an introduction of race where there was someone who had to be on top. There was always a comparison of which culture was better. And so from there it trickled down to society of oppression. Because then if someone's always better, then the mind has to have that generational cycle of, oh, I have to be oppressed because someone's better than me. And so there we have generational and it continues to go on because you're always thinking like, I want better, I need better. And then there's always someone who's doing better. And then when you don't have better, then you have that subculture, <coughs> that culture that looks down, which gives you that oppressive mind that you can't get better or you can't do better or you can't be better. I, based on your area or culture that you're from. I, I agree with that. Um, and that's a piece of messed up the fly <coughs> on the internet. But I'll push back just a little bit because there are some cultures that are more about the community and making sure that everybody is taken care of. And uh, I'm not here to say which one is better. You know? And there's something to this mindset. We'll talk a little bit about that. It was individualistic, materialistic, colonialistic mindset that we have here in America that makes people say, well, why can't you pull yourself up by your bootstraps? All things are not equal. 1964, the race begins, we're on a level playing field, when all along these folks are running around accumulating wealth and privilege and access and networks, and now you're on the same, come on, let's go. It doesn't work like that. There's these systemic barriers that are in the way that are preventing people from being able to be successful. So, uh, ponder that. <laughs> so how did we get here? And I'm just going to go into the historical narrative that um, I think is important for us to consider. We're talking now, let's, let's transport ourselves back in time when they were getting ready to colonize, to colonize the United States. And you know, the Europeans, British, Spanish, they were, they had, some, some of them had some religious freedom, some of them had, um, uh, just, just, they had the ability to colonize other lands. They had freedom to accumulate wealth, to own property, to do all of these things. And then when they came and they colonized these, colonized these areas, those same freedoms and rights didn't extend to those people or those lands that they were coming to. Okay, so that's the concept that you need to keep in mind when you think about this. You know, they were granted, and then. <coughs> Get my thoughts together here. You know, they established this country. You know, they had slaves over here who didn't have all these privileges. They had white indentured servants that came over as well that were poor. Not everybody back in those times owned slaves. There were a select few that did. There were a vast majority of whites that were poor and on the same level as these blacks. And as they started to come together, Baker's Rebellion was. One rebellion that happened historically, well, like, I'm like, okay, you know, if we don't do something to separate these races, then they're going to band together. They already outnumbered us. So, what can we do to separate them and keep them separated for all time? They came up with the racial bride. The racial bride <coughs> who had special privileges, access to Indian land. They were named as slave catchers and overseers. That was the beginning of our modern police force. That was the beginning of the prison industrial complex, if you listen to the show out of them. And what they ended up doing is they accepted the, I think it was W.E.B. Du Bois that put the psychological wages of whiteness as opposed to the economic benefit of bonding with people of color. That was the beginning of the division of the races. I think in this country, and it has long-standing effects to this day. 
and we make sure that Mike has a direct approach to the state to maintain that status quo. That's it. That racial pride was devastating for unity in this country. After slavery was abolished, after emancipation, then you had the rise of the new Jim Crow. Well, the rise of Jim Crow, the original Jim Crow. Hopefully we don't go back there. <laughs> Hope <and> prayer. <laughs> but uh, we'll have to see. But it was well laws, regulations, and rules which were enforced rigorously. Rigorously. It criminalized black behavior and it forced us into second class citizens. And inherent within that were the images that they used to characterize us. Before, blacks were docile slaves, they were good workers, things of that nature. But afterwards, there were all these type of images that they had of blacks. Um, this is what came out in the 1800s. Um, the Negro beast, or the image of God, which said that whites were superior beings and blacks were little more than that. Then you had images that they used. These are postcards that I took from a book called Understanding Jim Crow. I thought I notated that, but I didn't. So then you have us presented as savages or cannibals. You had other images. We're thieves. Even dogs don't like us. And dogs I found was a recurring theme in some of these um, advertisements from, from way back in the day. And as you can see, this was an advertisement for some fruit vendor. So this was seen sort of advertisements that become embedded in people's minds. People are internalizing these images and they're becoming to believe these things about people of color. Even our children were dangerous. Even our children were dangerous. A little shaving now. Or we're looking for an handout. I thought this was <laughs> when I saw a roll of palms, I thought I might have to see where the skin is, but then I realized this was in Florida. Very cute. Very cute. And then again, this one I thought was, I was horrified when I saw it. Two souls with but a single thought for synthesis became the concentrate of the chicken farm. So that yard girl, you know, even today. Well, that you feed into the stereotypes that they have about people of color, about black folks in particular. The chicken and everything stops. So these type of stereotypes and, and thoughts about people of color have become embedded over time. You know, in this final one here, you may not be able to see that, but this is advertising cream of wheat. I've always said, and now repeat, my health I'm due. The cream of wheat. And then again, the dog motif. So these images, and you'll see that, you'll see that again today in the advertisement that we have. When we talk about when we see advertising with people of color, the things they're doing, the dancing, you know, always remember the MC Hammer Chicken commercial. Does anyone remember that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it took me back for a minute of these arguments and having. Oh, uh, right. You know, so you know, think of anybody think of any other advertisements that just feel wrong to think about how they, they stereotype or characterize? Yeah, Beyonce. I mean, I can't stand look at you know, telling you, you know, because the meeting for all women. You know, there was something about that commercial. It was always eight. But yeah. Anyway, you know, I don't know. They get, like you said, they get used to it. You know, in other words, if you think that way, there's something wrong with you and not anything wrong with you. You know, and they don't think, you know, that that we have to Well you do get used to something if if you let yourself get used to it. Well we have to Right, but we can't get used to these things. We have to be able to call these things out like we see them. Yes. And also, about advertising. 
there. A lot of the cigarette advertisements that they used to do uh, were right with uh, those kinds of images as well. Uh, but you're right, alcohol, definitely. So, you know, how are these systems sustained over time? Uh, so what I'm getting ready to share with you now, we're getting ready to switch gears a little bit and move into um, the work by Eduardo Benia Silva. Um, and he did some mixed method research. He's a um, social scientist. And he did a review of a survey of social attitudes of college students. And he did a Detroit area study. Um, this N was only 10% of the, the population. It was 10% sample, a random sample. And he also did a, about a 20% random sample from this survey here. Um, and as you can see here, this initial survey of college students was 100% white students and almost 78%. Um, not only did he get their survey results, but he interviewed each of these people individually to sort of triangulate uh, his feedback. And his goal was to interpret and make meaning of their responses with regard to how whites react to uh, racial phenomena. Okay. So I'm glad this is here. If he's, on, if he's on point or not. So this is the part where you might feel uncomfortable. I hope not. We're just having an academic discussion here. And I'm just sharing with you this research which I found fascinating. Fascinating. So a couple of things first. He talks about this idea of a racial ideology. Uh, racially based frameworks used to justify for the dominant race or challenge for the subordinate race the racial status quo. And they're made up of these frameworks um, and these frameworks are rooted in their experiences. Um, and these frameworks consist of common frames, which we're going to go through. There's four of those racial stories, and then there's different styles. And the styles themselves are kind of like a garment, if you will. Um, you know, you can be in public and you're talking about racial issues, you've got a tuxedo, you're all fancy, you're using, you know, really kind words, nice words, you're not offending anybody. Or you can be amongst your peers. And you can be dressed down a little bit, and then the words you use are maybe not so nice. So these styles are important. These frames are important as well. And the thing to remember about this framework is that they kind of move together. They're loosely connected. Uh, it gives people some flexibility so that they can respond in different ways to different levels of racial phenomena. So what were the emergent frames or themes that came to his research from asking all these people questions, interviewing and looking at these surveys. There were four things that came up. Abstract liberalism, which we'll talk about. Naturalization, cultural racism, and the minimization of racism. So let's go through each. Abstract liberalism, as we touched on this just a moment ago, is tied to the individualist colonial history of the nation, where the freedoms were extended only to the bourgeoisie. Okay, not the inhabitants of the colonized land. So they were free to do whatever they wanted to do, but those freedoms didn't extend to those people who were colonized. So that made it easy for them to say, well, now in 1964, everything's equal. There's no need for affirmative action. There's no need for preferential treatment because we're all equal now, and you have the freedom that we have. But that negates the whole idea of this racial pluralism where different races don't have the same amount of power in society. They just don't. Whites have more power than blacks or anybody else in this society. So they can't move the same way. They can't command the same level of respect. So there's a fallacy that's embedded within this whole idea of this abstract liberalism. It's a fallacy. It wasn't until the late 20th century when the gates went up and we were able to move forward. And again, you don't consider these systemic barriers. They still exist and move throughout society. Naturalization. Again, we touched on that earlier. It's a natural occurrence. People naturally gravitate towards people who are like them. Um, Beverly Taylor wrote a book where all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria. And it explains how blacks internalize some of the deficit thinking and oppression 
and then they don't feel like they're good enough to sit at the table with these others, or they're not in these spaces where they can have conversations with people that are different from them. So they naturally come together with some security. <coughs> Cultural racism. This is, this is a piece that Ruby Payne um, really digs into. The deficit thinking is suggests that something is biologically or culturally wrong with an individual or a group of people. You touched on that just a little bit earlier. And minimization of racism. This is another frame that was very useful to some. They would say it's better now than in the past, but you can't compare what happened in the past to what's happening now. You know, because it was just a different environment. You know, the racism is still at the same rigor as it ever was. It's just that the mechanics of it may have changed a little bit. You know, um, this, this is Dr. Wallace. <laughs> um, going back more, you know, they were very early on in the African American community. People took sides, you know, there was this university worship and thinking kind of thing. The WP boys type of thing, the single market starting type.
they're having to pay people to move back into the city of city workers to try to get, and it, it is working. I mean, you know, giving them land for like a dollar, and so it's getting better. I mean, really buying land for a dollar. Um, but I mean, that is working. But the sad thing is, it, this is absolutely think about the liberalism or giving people their their rights to live where they want to live. It, it, it drastically to I mean, really change the what the city of Detroit is never. That's a, that's important that you mention that because you're afraid to answer the same question. People have to feel they do what they want to is maybe natural for them to, to want to move to these other spaces. Did you call that deficit? That's a rationalization. Oh, okay. That's a rationalization. Did you have a comment? Yes, Carla. Um, when you talk about the
You know, they say the earth is fine, you know, but I've seen some really, like, recently, like, I know it's like the white folks said it's really bad. Yeah, you know, and it's like, and so the focus is always black people for us, like people are, no, poverty is a problem. So how does that narrative serve the interests of our country? In what way? That's, that's a question. I mean, that's... A, There's a man called Slim Coleman. That's why I was asking you from yeah, there. Yeah, I remember Slim. Yeah, I remember him. I love that, yeah. Okay, he was a proud, you know, low economic group of white guys, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, worked for his community. Yeah. I always admire people like that right. because they weren't taken in by the um, the wealth of the other community, especially right. knowing where that wealth came from. You know, how can you like that? So right. that's another issue. Um, Slim Coleman said that my people
folder. And so the more we separate each other, the more we separate each other from each other, we don't know each other. And so we have to, we don't realize we're more alike than we're different. We're American. We all try to assimilate. It goes back to miseducation, uneducation. Yes. And, and, and all of us, yes. not just white people, but black people are miseducated, yes. uneducated, you know, with the history. Uh, and when we move from, you know, segregated to integrated, and we have like a social plan, and we have like a political somewhat plan, and not have an economic plan, so the economic impact on the, the, the minority community was devastating. devastating. Okay? So there are benefits with it, but you can't just put it out there. You know, just like we've had systematic racist things, and they still happen today, folks in America, you know, long we hear about it all the time, black people, you know, indiscriminate in terms of the color. Red line, etc. But you know, we have not, we have not held our leaders accountable for figuring out how to change these systems so that people have proper information, a proper education, and address the systematic systematic things that come along with it. You know, just, you just look at the black political. You know, sound bites, and people gravitate. And they believe those sound bites. No information, no facts, well, that's the, nothing else they got information. They got information. That's a big misconception about this last election. People think a lot of people were misinformed on their vote, and so a lot of misinformed people voted. But people that voted were informed. They just gave the wrong information. <laughs> 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 okay? That's why you see here about this fake news and you know, they, all, this, all this stuff is true. They ran a lot of the right wing runs a lot of stuff in middle of America. And these people hear this stuff and they read this stuff and they believe it. So they think they're making an informed decision. Exactly. You know, but see, then we look, it's like, how did they make that decision? And then a lot of people even when they say, well, how did a woman vote for Donald Trump? Well, how did Donald Trump he say he's going to grab this and say, how could you vote for this man? But a lot of the information they get was suppressed. They didn't get the information on this guy like we did. And so that's why we got what we got. To your point, um, I saw shortly after the election, a uh, friend of mine posted an article about how the UAW was uh, instrumental in getting a thousand jobs from Mexico back to uh, Ford in Detroit, right? Right. Uh, and they were crediting Pres uh, President-elect Trump. I clicked on the link, right? Yeah. The article's a year old. Yeah. It came from October 2015, but yeah. it's false headline. This information goes out. No one bothers to do any sort of investigation. And I pointed out to my friend that the article's a year old. But the people that that also clicked on that said, well, it's due to Trump's policy. Like, Trump's policy. He wasn't president yet. He wasn't president yet. Hey, you know? hey, How could that be possible? He just tweeted yesterday, like, hey, I made four great jobs back. Right. No, he did. No. <laughs> it was a, the article was over a year old. It's you know? So it's like. People don't look at the fine details. They see what they want. They extract what they want. And to Mr. Walsh's point, I do have a, a, a plain devil, devil's advocate about segregation. Uh, Chinatown, great example of segregation working out very well for a community of folks that don't speak English, because I believe we're all speaking about English speaking, or at least common language uh, in the society, black, white, whatever, uh, culturally, um, and language differences, uh, the Chinese community uh, can rely on uh, Chinatown. You know, folks speak the same language. They have doctors um, at schools that are all, they're very much a separate pocket of civilization within a civilization or a society. So in case in point, you know, segregation does work, but I do believe on the flip side of that, that long-term it's uh, harmful. As I've, I've worked with individuals that have had their children enrolled in Chinese schools. They live in the United States, and they don't learn English. So you know that's that's a problem long term. You know, mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, they all live at home together. They speak Chinese at home. They don't speak English. Well, what's that say for your kids? So long term, it's a poor decision. Short term, uh, for folks that don't speak the language, for, and this is any ethnic minority that comes from another nation, um, I think it, it's it can work for a short period of time. Thank you for sharing. My Good pleasure. Question. Two yeah. more and that's even more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, the one thing though, you know, and we're talking about um, those marginalized and, and specifically most 
marginalized is African American. He, unlike other cultures, unlike other people, you know, like the Asians and other ones, did not have their culture uh, devastated and had to adopt and be dominated by another culture. And so there's a different psychological aspect when that occurs because African Americans cannot be compared to any other culture because of that one big fact. We don't have we don't have language because we don't know even what nation we came from, what, what group we came from in Africa, because all of that was devastating. So African Americans are in a unique position in comparison to others. So that's why Africa has become still has a group your point, they have yeah. to support them. And they, and they do the same so thing. So if you look at African-Americans, it's a better deal with slavery, but we all just first. I'm a dark-skinned male. I grew up in the black community. We grown. My, my first 10 years of my life, I thought my name was black and I was discriminated because I was a dark-skinned guy. Now, y'all ain't that true now. Come on. Dark wasn't in right now. Uh -huh. We talked about it.
when you encounter uh, deficit or, or stereotypes. Um, and in Waterloo and Silver, he offered that there are certain linguistic matters, strategies that some people use when they discuss race. They include avoidance, there was semantic food, projection, minimization, and incoherence. And the avoidance piece, you know, if you think historically, um, you know, before I guess the civil rights era, when people could say anything they need to about life, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Because there's nothing that we could do about it. Okay, that that post-civil rights, that kind of language uh, was no longer in vogue. So they started to use more coded language, um, different ways of addressing or, or, or describing individuals. And um, there's a book that came out of Dog Whistle Politics that I would encourage you all to take a look at um, that really digs into the way people will describe um, people of color. And they're, they're saying what I'm saying. They're saying, you know, have, you, have any of you ever seen the, the video of what's that politician, that, um, the political strategist that worked with uh, Nixon? And he said, well, you don't say we're here, here, you say force busting, or you say states' rights. Do you remember that? Yeah. It's a different way of talking about it. You're still talking about the issue, but you're avoiding the, the, the harmful language. Well, it's just like the police thing. Yeah. So the, the racist profile, they tell us to find criminal indicators. Right. right. Criminal indicators. Criminal indicators. So there's an avoidance strategy. So there's semantic moves that they use, and even shields. Um, you know, they'll say, hey, I'm not prejudiced, but, and then they'll say something special. <laughs> you know, say, I'm not black, well, I don't know. <laughs> or, you know, they may agree, you know, that, oh, in principle, I think this is right, but, you know, if you do something this way, then it's prejudice against white people. So we there's semantic moves that are often used. Then there's this idea of projection. Uh, and this projection, you know, it helps people escape those responsibilities and it fixes blame elsewhere. And this is most commonly used. I guess interracial couples will say, hey. Well, I don't have a problem with uh, interracial couples, but think about children. They're projecting that onto the child, but they still have an issue with the fact that individuals are, you know, that their miscegenation is happening. So people project the defense mechanism when you're projecting, you're trying to escape responsibility for the racist beliefs that you may carry by saying, oh, well, there's something else over here that you need to be concerned about. And minimization. And then it's a very similar phenomenon. Yes.
That was Black Lives Matter. That was a conversation point. They were pushing. And then and there, another black guy killed him, and then they're chained again. So we were, we were there. We, we were right there. We were to talk about these things and have that national conversation. But then the media cycle, the news cycle just turned, and then we went on down that road. And it got us where we are today. So we almost made it. We almost made it. But I don't know if anyone else observed that as they watched the national conversation. But that's what I saw. 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 But the last uh, semantic move is the idea of incoherence. Have you ever been talking to somebody about race and they can't even find a word to express themselves? Because they just, they're, they're trying not to say the offensive words and you try to have a conversation and, and, and they, they get real frantic. So that was the last one of the uh, semantic moves that uh, involved. I mean, this still was found that he did this, this mixed message survey of all of these students. So, you know, I had a question, why are black students more comfortable speaking about race in public settings? But if I get you all talking again, I'll never finish this. But that's something to consider. I mean, that's something really to consider. Why are black more comfortable? And the solution that came to my mind was that the you oppressed know, are always familiar about the nuances of the oppressed, because the failure to uh, and here, those standards of the quorum could mean that. But for white people, they didn't have to do that. They didn't have to measure their thoughts on their comments. They didn't have to, to deal with those the same type of They didn't deal with it in the same type of way. So I just wanted to leave that with you. So how we had a conversation, we talked about this earlier, including the historical narrative. Um, one of the things that most, one of the important things to do is to identify your own personal biases. And this is causing, this is, Cause you to do some self-assessment and self-reflection. How many of you have ever heard of the Harvard implicit bias test? Only one person in the room? Two people? Three? Four? Okay, okay, all right. For those of you who haven't taken it, I'll make the, you can just Google it, and then you'll be able to go to the website. This is an ongoing thing, and it provides an opportunity for you to look at if you're biased racially, if you're biased against religion, if you're biased against black people. You know, they have multiple tests that you can take, and you can identify, you know, which side, how do you link? You need to know these things about yourself so that you can interrogate why you feel that way, and then make sure that you check yourself when you find yourself being biased and discriminatory against someone else. And then ask yourself, you know, to what degree has race impacted your life? And how are stereotypes influencing how you treat others? You know, these are things that you need to do as part of the self-assessment. And this information comes from Leslie Aguilar, uh, Ouch, That Stereotype Hurts, which is a thin book, but it's very powerful. Um, you need to be able to speak up against bias if you encounter it. Um, it's important to give feedback in a manner that opens the door for conversation that doesn't necessarily you know, shut things down entirely. Because you can respond to somebody in such a way where you would damage the relationship beyond repair. So some of the things I'm going to show you are ways in which you can do that effectively. Well, there's eight ways that stereotypes can surface. Jokes, name calling, stereotypical descriptors, spokesperson syndrome, you know what that is? So someone that says you're the only black in the room and you're the spokesperson for the entire race. Um, descriptors that contradict existing stereotypes. We need to find a qualified authority for this position. You know, why, why can't a person of color just be qualified? I mean, you know, why does it have to be described as such a term? Um, these are ways that stereotypes can surface. So now I'm going to show you some ways that you can even encounter them to deal with it effectively. So the first thing that you should do is assume good intent. So if someone says something racist, you're like, oh, I don't know you mean, brother. What you said bothers me. You know, what did you really mean? Can you, can you expound a little bit more on that? You know, to get them to think about not only what they just said, but then to see if they can restate it perhaps in a different way. You know, and good intentions uh, indicate that negative impact. Rephrase what was said. Sometimes when you repeat what was said that was offensive and use more inclusive language, 
you give that individual the language to uh, describe it better next time. Okay, it lets them know that you know those buzzwords that you were used are not necessarily welcome. I don't appreciate them. Um, you know, it, it, it continues the dialogue in a way that's not necessarily offensive. Interrupt and redirect. <coughs> Someone might start off telling some joke that you know is going to be distasteful. You can be like, oh, wait a minute, I don't want to hear it. You know, and then just, just put a call to that. And they will know that you are offended. I want to hear what your friend is saying. And they can choose to take the conversation in another direction. Or you can choose to just walk away. But you didn't, you didn't validate what they were doing by not doing anything at all. But your silence sometimes has the power to validate those things when you're in those environments. You let people just go, you want to tell those kinds of jokes. Appeal to someone's empathy. But again, it can be worse if that person has empathy. If they're empathetic, they may not be. You know, but you can at least try. You know, ask them to consider how would someone else feel, how would you feel if you were described in, in certain terms? Um, that usually has some impact. Uh, broaden, to you, broaden what they're describing is universal human behavior. You know, those blacks are all in place. We don't like to work against them. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean 22 years. So if you need to be able to do that, okay, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I didn't you know mean, I Tierra, I, oh, she's, she's, she's the best. I swear she is. I wouldn't be able to do this without her. I, I would sit, I'd sit tomorrow. And then again, if you want to ask the question, you know, ask them, you know, what do you mean? And ask them to clarify. That always is a good way to interrupt that. And then you can just simply say, ouch. The simple four letter word, just say, ouch, that hurts. What? You know? And then you know, if somebody steps on your toe, that stops everything. And then you have to think about what just occurred. So, very simple ways in which you can um, you know, interrupt when you encounter somebody who's exhibiting this kind of behavior. Um, you have to be willing to accept it as well personally. If you're the one who does it and somebody calls you out, it's very important. People are reluctant for whatever reason to apologize and say, I'm sorry. But there's a way that you should go about it. You should acknowledge the intent. And the impact of what you just said, what did you just say that was so offensive? Why is that person offended? And you can store that in your catalog of experiences so you don't do it next time. Ask for clarification if you're unsure on exactly what it was that you did. You know, you may not know. If someone takes put you to the side, maybe now, maybe later, but you need to really understand that because people can be offended by a whole host of things. You can adjust and change and move on in an inclusive way. And I'll end with this quote from Stevenson and Lennon. Despite the extraordinary and groundbreaking efforts of civil rights women to bring about racial equality, sustainable reform will only occur when white people individually and collectively embrace and encourage change. At the very least, white educators must allow change to happen. Without their active participation in this way, racial injustices will continue to be viewed by white people as primarily concerned for only people of color. We all need to be invested in this process. Okay, let's stop putting the blame or the onus on white people alone. We need to continue to challenge the status quo. We need to continue to have these conversations. We need to continue to understand and relate to each other. Um, and then we can make this world a better place, make America great. <laughs> Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. <laughs> On the middle of the table, there are some surveys. If you can please take a moment to fill those out. Um, I'd appreciate the feedback so I can improve.